Hello, Instagram. Hello, Facebook. Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? It's so wonderful to see you. Even though, hi, hi. On Instagram, I always look like I've been fake tanning for days, but I haven't been. I just am orange on Instagram. Orange on Instagram. That should be like a memoir. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Earthling from Toronto. And and Corinne from Lilyhammer, how you doing? And Florence and Catherine and Christian and Manuel and Dr. Donna, hi there. And another Stephanie and Esther and Liza. Hello, how is everybody? Ah, oh, so good to see you. Hmm. Doesn't give me numbers anymore on how many folks are here. So I am just going to assume that we're all pretty happily gathered here. Uh huh. So, usually I wait, but today I'm going to just say hello to Deborah and Carmen and Amna and um, Marcia and Ruta and another Stephanie and many Stephanies and Val, and we'll get going. How's that? So, this morning I woke up and I thought, this is going to be the greatest day ever because I have a pretty busy Sunday planned tomorrow, but today is Saturday and I don't have anything on today. I am just going to roll about in my pajamas and I'm going to like play computer solitaire and other things that are thrilling to me since the pandemic began. I just thought, oh, it's going to be the greatest empty day because I've got a lot to do on Sunday. <laughs> and then I looked at my phone to check my happenings for the day and found that Saturday just went by and it's Sunday. Has that ever happened to you? Have you lost a day? This is the high point of my Sunday, but I had a lot of things to do today. So I had this, I was set in one direction, er, law of inertia, inertia, a body when put in motion must remain in motion, will remain in motion until acted on by an equal and opposite force. Well, the equal and opposite force hit me. I was cruising into the happiest day ever and wham, lost a whole day. Uh, on the other hand, I know somebody who lost a whole year. She thought she was a certain age and her parents came for her birthday and told her she was a year older <laughs> than she had thought. So at least I only lost a day, but here's what I did. I thought, no worries, I can gird up and like head into a busy day when I was expecting not to do anything at all. It's okay. <sighs> and then I started going to my loved ones and saying, hey, let's make New Year's resolutions to work harder. And they became surly and depressed. And then I became surly and depressed because I was counting on them to pep me up after my shock and all. Not shock and all, shock and all. And then I just thought everybody was hostile and surly and miserable and I thought, it's time for a break. And then I thought, you know, when the gathering room comes, I'm going to tell them about breaks because very few people take real breaks. And the holiday season is a travesty of pseudo breaks. It's supposed to be a break from everything, right? Huh? 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 huh. There's like 10 times as much to do. Um, the days are either incredibly short and dark if you're in the Northern Hemisphere or very long and weirdly unseasonably hot if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's not less work for a grown-up. It's, it's kind of more. And you can't keep doing more and more and more work unless you have breaks. This is something that Henry Ford did not believe and he forced people to work all through the day without taking breaks. And as, as a result, the turnover in his factories was 90% per month because we all need breaks. So then they instituted breaks in factory labor, not Henry Ford, but someone else, and found out that productivity really rose. But the breaks became weirdly uh, part of the job. Like then you had to stand around and do certain things during your break. The cigarette break was a big deal. And that used to pet people right up until we found out that cigarettes were killing us. So that went away. And people forgot the art of taking breaks, you guys, but I'm gonna tell you how. Because breaks, that's the only reason I'm alive today, let alone talking to you on a machine. 
So here's, I learned the, the joy of breaks when I literally was almost broken, paradoxically enough. When I was very, I was young, I was a young parent, I was grieving because of my son's Down syndrome diagnosis. I was, I had like three different jobs, four if you count parenting. And uh, life was tough and I did not know how to take breaks. And I was in perpetual unhappiness and exhaustion for a long time. And it got so bad, people used to say, well, I'd like ask for spiritual support and people would say, it's all about surrender. And I'd be like, okay, I surrender. I, I'm not fighting anybody, I'm not, I give up. I give up, white flag, never felt any better. What I realized finally was that the way to take a break, the way to surrender is simply to stop trying to feel anything you're not feeling in the moment. And it's not, don't try to do anything for a while. Then here's the process. Find some time, set aside some time. So all of us are here on the gathering room. We've set aside this half hour. Okay, now for the next 10 minutes, I want you to make a little vow to yourself in your own mind that for 10 minutes, you're just gonna let everything hang the way it is. You're gonna let the world, your life, your horrible ex, the holiday coming out, and your money, everything, you're just gonna let it be what it is for 10 minutes. 10 minutes is not gonna change anyway, right? So you're just not gonna try to change anything about your life for the next 10 minutes. And then I want you to sit with nothing to do and nothing to change and nothing to struggle against and stop trying to feel anything that you're not feeling right now. So when I started this, what I was feeling was oceanic sadness. I was miserable. But the moment I just let myself be that miserable, I found myself slightly less miserable because, as one of my favorite Buddhist priests, Shinzen Young says, um, suffering is misery times resistance. So take whatever you're feeling that's negative and multiply it by the amount of energy you're spending trying not to feel it. So the misery is, it multiplies with resistance and it gets to some very big numbers. On the other hand, by the way, if you're feeling really good and you're taking a break and you're totally unattached to that, joy is the pleasure you're feeling multiplied by the, uh, by the willingness to let go. So resistance keeps you in a place of intense suffering. Letting go brings you down to much less suffering. As you start to suffer less, letting go brings you into greater levels of happiness. But right now, I'm going to assume that it's not a perfect day for everybody out there, right? So you're just going to sit there, and I tried this right before we went live. And I thought, oh, this is interesting because I've got all kinds of stuff going on inside me, right? Because I'm like getting all the machines ready and people are helping me. Well, Ro is helping me. <laughs> it's not like I have a staff here. I have Ro who helps me with everything and Lila who is one and is continuously tearing everything apart. That's my staff. Um, so I noticed that what I was feeling right before we went live, it was kind of like walking down a busy city street um, where people are, some people are running and some people are ambling and some people are with lovers and some people look like they're thinking deeply. And I was just watching, I, oh wow, there's quite the little convoy in my head. There's, all, oh, there's this and that emotion and I'm not gonna try to make anything what it isn't. It's kind of like sitting down at a cafe and I'm just gonna watch the people go by. Mm -hmm. Oh, that person looks really, really sad. Oh, I feel really, really sad. And I can tell already by some of the hearts that are coming up on Instagram that the moment you stop trying not to feel how you're feeling, the moment you say for the next 10 minutes, let it be. Seriously, let it be no matter how miserable or angry or sad or sick I feel. I'm just going to be that. Miserable and angry and sad and sick. And after three or four breaths, actually, it starts to feel less oppressive to me. I don't know if that's because I've been practicing a long time. But I knew today that I was gonna have to do that because things were getting, things were not looking good in our household. We were all a little surly and hostile. Everybody, including the, the baby was like, no, hell no, I'm not doing anything you want. 
So then I said, okay, let's all take a break. First, I took my own break. I was like, wow, I really don't want to work today <laughs> because I have stuff due in the week that I should have done earlier and it was my busy Sunday. I really gr woke up not wanting to do this and I'm grumpy and I'm going to be grumpy and I'm just going to be there. Immediately, everyone in the house seemed to go, just a little bit of a shift. And I was like, hey, why don't we all just do nothing? At which point, all the sullenness that we had been projecting at each other went away completely, and everybody just started to be together again. And we weren't particularly thrilled, but we also weren't upset anymore. Like, it, it evaporated quite rapidly. And then I remembered something. I remembered three things about taking a real break. Because I've been doing this, as I said, for like 30 years. And when I go into the place where I stop resisting, I remember all the other times I took a break. It's as though there are all these pearls strung on a single thread of time. And I started thinking, I started, what was it like when I lived in Phoenix? And what I remembered were, the, were my breaks. I would sit, I, I went through a really tough time while I was living in Phoenix. And um, it wasn't as bad as the earlier time with Adam, but it was bad, it was bad. And I would let myself just sit with my morning cup of coffee on this little uncomfortable canvas chair and not feel anything I wasn't already feeling and not try to change anything. And when I look back on living in Phoenix, the strongest, most vivid memories and the most pleasant are those moments I was just sitting on that uncomfortable canvas chair, not trying. Then I think, oh, I remember, I loved California. And I think about California and you know what? The time that I spent meditating in California, just doing nothing, I did, I was active, I wrote a book, I was trying to do things, I did a lot of coaching. I don't remember that very well. <laughs> what I remember, what's really true and present for me are those moments that I just sat in the forest or sometimes inside and didn't try to do anything I wasn't already doing. Just let everything happen as it was happening. So I thought, here's the thing about a real break. Number one, you can take one anytime you have like five minutes is plenty, two if that's all you got, but you have to really dedicate it. For those minutes, no trying. No trying to feel anything besides what you're feeling. Just let it be. And if you can get there, number one advantage, you get immediate relief. Immediately the misery stops being multiplied by resistance, or immediately the pleasure stops being dulled by attachment. So all of a sudden everything opens up. You get immediate increase in your mood. Number two, you start to create memories that are of actual presence. Like as a soul having a human experience, you have put another pearl or diamond on that string of time that you came to collect. That's all we came here to get is our treasure of memories, right? And the ones that we spend not resisting are the ones that shine. And it's, it's as if the string on which those are strung, those pearls or diamonds, is my soul itself. It's like every time I really take a break, I add another jewel to the string of time that is this life, this one human life. And then finally, a little miracle occurs and it actually doesn't fail. Like if you can really take a break this way, the miracle happens and the miracle is this when you stop striving the consciousness of the universe awakens inside you and starts to move so i said to my family this morning we're all just taking a total break because they were all like we don't want to do what you want to do and as soon as we all let go everyone actually started to move it was so interesting it was almost like a dance people got up and started you know were excited and interested in projects and it was all because we weren't doing it we weren't trying to force it to be a fun time or an easy time or a hard working time or anything we were just taking a break and when I take a break that's when I start to create things that's when I start to make deeper relationships only it's not me it's all of us it's it's the great consciousness of the universe and it can't function freely through us until we let go of resistance, until we just decide to take a break from all the striving we do as humans. 
So that's what you can do any time during this busy holiday season or any time. You, know, you may be watching this months from now. Take 10 minutes. Let it all go. Feel whatever you're feeling, even if it's awful, it will be better, I promise, when you stop resisting it. And then notice how you start to collect this beautiful necklace of memories on the, soul, on the string of your soul and how the infinite steps in and begins to use your life to do what it wants. So Mary Oliver said, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I think I want to give mine to the consciousness of the universe and see what it does if I'm just perpetually on a break. <laughs> so that's what I have to say about that. And now I would like to read some of your questions, if any. So, yes. Madeline says, is doing nothing meditating? Not for me. Um, I do meditate, but it's actually very disciplined and focused. It's very focused attention on my breath or then on, I can track a physical sensation or an emotional sensation through my body. And that is a form of meditation. But meditation is actually harder <laughs> than what I'm asking you to do right now. Taking a break is, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna freaking meditate. I'm not doing anything value added. I'm just gonna sit here and feel resentful that I lost a day this week. <laughs> like, you can be as petulant as you want. You can be as um, babyish or irrational. You don't have to pay close attention. You just, you're literally just on a break. So for me, it's easier than meditation. Oh, and Caitlin says, I didn't see this because it was so tiny. Uh, Caitlin says, this is so timely. Any tips for getting out of ADHD hyperfocus? I have a really overwhelming project I'm working on and I try to pace myself and take breaks. But yesterday I got a stitch in my side because I hyperfocused so hard I forgot to even breathe. Oh, you are my twin soul. <laughs> I, I hyperfocused so hard. Like I learned to play pet rescue, which is a game for seven year olds. And I played it so hard for like 50 straight hours that I got tendonitis in both arms. <laughs> and I was watching tutorials made by four year olds. Just do this. Yeah, I've done the hyper focus thing and it has helped me earn degrees and, and write books, but it's also broken me a lot. So when you get broken, the stitch is the alarm going off in your body that says, Oh, wait, um, Caitlin, come on home, come on back from your hyper focus. It's a lot of fun in there have to say but it's not the same as a break it wears you out you get tired of that after several days without sleep <laughs> and or for me several minutes now so when you notice the the icky feeling like there comes a moment when you're starting to push yourself into the attention because your mind is so hyper focused but your body is tired or maybe your emotions are tired you will notice some kind of suffering and that's an alarm bell saying Beep, 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 take a break, take a break from whatever it is. And if you have a concept, it's time for a break and I know a break will do me good, it's easier to get out of the hyperfocus. But that is a very alluring little trap you're in and I, uh, I'm right in there with you. I just, I enjoy it all. City Lotus says, why does resisting, oh, why does resisting a feeling like self abandonment increase the suffering? I believe it's because it removes you from reality. So if you have, if something's hurting you and you say, not only is it hurting, but I'm going to pretend that it's not hurting, that is self-abandonment. And if you say, I am not going to let myself come back and take care of myself, allow myself the emotions I'm really feeling, you're abandoning yourself and then you're, you're stabbing any part of you that wants to come back and take care of you. So every... Self-abandonment is a form of resistance and then resisting the feeling of self-abandonment, it just escalates and escalates until you can go into a panic attack or a depression. All of those are your alarm bell going, take a break, take a break. Let yourself feel whatever you're feeling. Oceanic grief, like volcanic anger, emotions on the level of natural disasters, they all start to feel better the moment you stop resisting them and just do nothing. Okay, Donna says, can we take a break while we're in the middle of something that we're doing, like in the midst of getting a medical treatment? Can we take a break? Yes. As long as you aren't like actively giving a speech, 
yeah, I've never taken a complete break while actively giving a speech. But if you're in a, any kind of passive situation, a doctor's waiting room or getting a treatment and nobody's asking anything of you, those are the best times to take breaks. If you can learn to take a break every time you stop in traffic, put the car in park, take a break for 30 seconds. The faster you learn to drop into the break position, the more you're continuously able to relax. And this is another gift that I believe we get from taking a break, and that is that we train the brain to let go of its intensity. And our culture tells us to hang on to problems until we've solved them. I believe, I'm not a brain scientist, but I, I read a lot of brain science, I believe that that constant encouragement, keep working, keep pushing, keep fixing, I think it actually keeps us in the fight or flight um, situation and makes our brains more likely to be anxious brains. So taking a break, I, I do believe, actually has another uh, additional benefit of permanently changing that neuroplastic part of the brain that can be very upset when you're trying to resist. Lydia says, today I took a break by doing something, some crafty activities whilst watching TV. Is this a way of tricking my brain into allowing things to be? It could be. Anything with your hands and with visual things, try, it moves the brain over into the right hemisphere. And um, that will allow the left side of the brain, the left side hippocampus, Jill Bolte Taylor would say, to stop trying to control everything to death. So once you are doing something with your hands or doing something with visuals or moving your whole body outside, those are all things that help you take a break from the left side of your brain, from the constant pushing. But there is a time when even, like I draw and paint, and there's a time when even that feels tiring. Even that feels like a push. Maybe I'm physically exhausted and need to sleep, or maybe there's another attention trying to, uh, sorry, another energy trying to get my attention. And by focusing it all onto a creative project, I'm actually fighting it. There's this feeling of resistance that's a little bit like rubbing a cat backwards. <laughs> like the, you know the fur needs to be smooth, and when you uh, pet the cat the wrong way, it feels staticky and awful. When the energy feels like that, that's when it's time to take a break. And you just sort of clunk down into not doing, and the force arises and starts to make things feel like you're petting the cat the right way. So um, crafty things are great if they're relaxing you and you're, it feels like a break, but sometimes even put down your knitting needles, put down your craft scissors and just sit there. All right, um, um, there am, um, I can't read that, but the, I can't read the name, but the real Amanda, that's who it is, the real Amanda. What were the three things the person who had a near death experience said? One, you're infinitely loved. Two, you can't mess this up. Three, yeah, you're infinitely loved. Uh, you can't make a mistake and you are always safe. Yeah, those are good things to know right there. You just sit in that, that's a break right there. Uh, Katie Connecting says, when surrendering to life and letting likes, I likes and dislikes fade, how does that fit with the way of integrity and what the body signals? What a wonderful question, Katie. Yeah, any resistance to the way things are in this moment is in a technical sense, if you want to split hairs, a kind of lie. Because our bodies and our souls are tapped into the real flow of reality. And the mind can actually go at cross purposes. We can really pretend that things are fine when the body and soul know they aren't fine. We can, um, more often, we really believe things are not fine when the body and soul think, eh, it's all right, except for the damn mind. So anytime you feel that staticky sensation or exhaustion of any kind or resistance of any kind, look for the place you're not aligned with reality. The quickest way to do that is not to say, oh, I'm out of integrity, where am I lying? Although I sometimes use that language with myself. The best way is just go, I'm gonna do absolutely freaking nothing for five minutes, by the clock, gonk, like set an alarm, gonk. <sighs> oh, you know what? Everything's actually kind of fine. <laughs> or, oh, I was really sad and pretending I wasn't. Or, oh, I was really convinced this was Saturday and I was going to try to force it to be Saturday if I had to clench my tiny prince's fists all day long. 
No, you just you let go and you come into reality, which is the truth. Animals can't live outside reality, so they can't lie. So they never feel that horrible suffering that comes from being separate from what, separate at one level, the mind, from what they experience as the truth at different levels, which is the body, the heart, and the soul. Okay. Susan said, I had transient global amnesia. The universe gave me a break because I didn't do it. Wow. Sit with that one for a minute. Um, I don't know if Susan is the same person who went on the Oprah show years and years ago after being in a, a coma. She had a stroke. Was it a stroke? She had amnesia and then she went into a coma. So they think it was a stroke. But um, she was just out cold for a month. And she went on Oprah and she said, I'm absolutely convinced that my body did that for me and the universe did that for me because I was heading my life in the wrong direction and I was really unhappy and I, I was exhausted. And somebody in the audience said, you know, it's so admirable that you pushed yourself that hard. And she was like, really? I don't think so, really. I think I, think I was just doing, I was trying to be a good girl, but was it really good? She said, I don't think so. And the next time, I need a vacation. I'm just going to go to Hawaii or somewhere. It's a lot less expensive than being in a coma for a month. So yeah, Susan, I hope, I'm, I'm glad the amnesia was transient and I'm glad the universe gave you a break. And thanks for sharing that with us. Mina says, how to get out of the break I stay in, if I stay in it for so long that I won't take the inspired action? That's the thing about a real break. I mean, uh, it's a, a fake break is when you're like, I am going to lie here. I'm going to strew rose petals around. I'm going to take a special bubble bath with my scented candles and my champagne or whatever. They're like cultural models of taking a break. If you do that, often you're just trying to dull the pain of not living exactly relaxed into the truth of your life. When you completely relax, I mean really relax, you're resistant. Like, I just feel what I feel. I don't, uh, you know, maybe I'll have a glass of something, maybe I won't, but I'm just going to feel what I feel. I mean, I have done this my whole life. I have been such a feeble creature, and I have taken so many breaks, and it's always the break that ends up getting me moving, because I, I really believe this. I'm not moving. When I am weak and sick and immobilized, the force can take this body and do all kinds of things with it. But not when I'm taking, not taking a real break. So I think you just take an even deeper break, Mina, because it just gets better and better. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, how do you do so when it's hard to let go in a context that feels unsafe? You can let go into the feeling of I'm not feeling safe. You can be like, I'm really scared. And then what happens, as my friend Gavin De Becker would say, is sometimes the force within you awakens the, the gift of fear, which is a calm, uh, very, very strong compulsion to take intelligent action. But it doesn't come from the mind. It comes from relaxing into the truth that you don't feel safe. And how many of you out there have stayed, for example, in relationships that didn't feel safe, telling yourself to feel safe, before you finally like got divorced or whatever and looking back you realize oh if I had completely relaxed and let myself feel what I was feeling that didn't feel safe I was forcing it the whole time so yeah if you don't feel safe relax into not feeling safe it, I know that sounds paradoxical Stephanie says should we think of this same principle as applies to bodily sensations like pain 100% I have had all kinds of pain. I have had neuroplastic pain. I have had chronic pain. I have had pain from injuries. And I am here to tell you that all of them respond beautifully to taking a break. And they can help you keep a break going for hours if it hurts enough. <laughs> you can just, it's such a relief to be out of the agony that it teaches you to stay in that break, in that complete relaxation of the mind for long periods of time. And that actually was a gift that life has given me, and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, Susanna says, this is our last question, is the ultimate goal to live in break mode and then parse out time to do work, take care of family, etc., but always with the drive and intent to returning to break mode? Or does the nature of life require break modes only to be short and fleeting? I think that break mode can be permanent 
and that if we're always in it, we will take care of our careers and we will take care of our relationships and families, only it won't be us, it will be, the, it will be our intelligence plus the vast intelligence of nature and the universe and the other people around us. I couldn't believe today how when I finally remembered to take a break, my whole family just started moving in this, this dance almost of, of sweetness that had been so missing before. And I said to them, we're taking a break, and it got, the dance got sweeter. And nobody felt effort in that, and yet we all started doing things. And that's the miracle. That's where you have to, you have to take the risk of surrendering it all to find out how the miracle takes over your life. And I don't do it all the time, but that's my goal. And I'm gonna die trying to just be in break time all the time. If you wanna hear more about surrender, um, Ro and I are doing that as a podcast soon in our Bewildered podcast, so tune into that. And in the meantime, take lots of breaks this, this holiday season, you guys. Take lots of breaks, whatever time you're in because ultimately those breaks are the jewelry we take back from this experience as a human to wherever our souls go later. Thanks you guys, I love you. See you next week on The Gathering Room. End live video.